King of Podcasts proudly presents The Broadcaster's Podcast, a weekly media commentary talking about traditional and digital media headlines and talking to the content creators out front and behind the scenes. Here is the King of Podcasts. Happy New Year, everybody, and welcome to year three of the Broadcasters Podcast, presented by BroadcastersPodcast.com. I am the King of Podcasts, and I welcome you to episode 103 of the program. No interview this week, because it's time to go ahead and, go ahead and work on getting some new recordings set up and scheduled when I was, what, about eight weeks ahead on doing interviews? So, so until I get some more recordings scheduled into the mix, I'll go ahead and feature myself going through a lot of different stories that I want to go and get into to start off the year because there's a lot of prognosticating and a lot of things that need to be looked at when it comes to the full spectrum, the whole perspective of digital media and content creation coming into 2020. Here's what's going on. Number one I want to talk about this week is what I am expecting to go and talk about with a number of people that are going to be hopefully joining me here on the program to talk about the labor unions, to talk about the Hollywood labor crisis of 2019, 2020 now, started in 2019. But now we're here. We're going to go back and look over about 10 years ago at the last time this kind of happened and how things worked out and look at what digital disruption has done as a result. We're going to go into the digital disruption and what's going to be happening now as we lead into 2020. Some of the professionals are out there giving their prognostications as to what they think will happen very soon. And then we'll look at how it affects the Hollywood labor crisis. So of all the major labor unions that that are out there, how one entity will run into the next entity getting into their labor negotiations and so on and so forth. Because it is a set of dominoes that are now set right now. And we're looking at the stories. And a resolution among all these labor unions is not going to happen overnight. It's probably not going to happen, maybe if we're lucky by the end of the year, but this is a major crux. This is a major moment in terms of media because, as we've talked about, Napster never prepared anybody for what was going to disrupt the music industry in the late 90s. Nobody knew that streaming media like Netflix or Hulu was going to affect cable as much as it does now going into the 20s and here we are who knew that podcasting would disrupt so much of what is radio programming and what music is played on the radio as well because all this right here has encompassed all the changes that have happened now on this program we normally talk about the corporate conformities the social conformities whether it's political, social, cultural, all the things that affect the programming that we consume and how we entertain ourselves, how we enjoy ourselves. But I want to make sure to let all the content creators that listen to this program, however many many of you listen to this program intently and listen to this show every week, I want to make a pledge that I want to ask all of you to be cognizant of going into 2020 when it comes to journalists when it comes to content creators everybody journalists most importantly please remember that you're dealing with if you're doing information and entertaining remember it's five questions we're trying to ask five questions who what when where and why and five senses see hear taste smell touch Five questions, five senses. Can't make it much more simple than that. And I hope all of you will realize that with your content, for media, those are the questions that should be asked. And anything that's outside of that, it's really keep it simple. Because so many different things are getting debunked. We're seeing, obviously, how social and cultural and corporate conformity continue to fail at every spot. And we look at how deregulation, conglomerations, mergers, acquisitions continue to go on because it's just the way it is. Grassroots only comes to us at some point 
And then the corporate giants come in and they start getting their claws into things. And these are the kind of issues we want to go ahead and keep our eyes at. As content creators, you need to be vigilant and following attentively as to where your content's going and where to put your content and where to pitch your content. It's very important. Now, social media and YouTube and video sites are, they're they're still grassroots. They're still the Wild West. And a lot of people are going to be finding talent from those sites. Pretty obvious. As opposed to your traditional auditions. So keep all of that in mind as you go into 2020, if you are looking to get yourself out there, if you're part of the scene, if you're part of music, movies, TV, and radio. That's what this show's all about. And going into the third year, there's no slowing down of this program. I'm hoping to continue to build this audience up. It's been a slow build, but we're getting an audience here that is why, that is catching on to this show each and every week. And I hope people will go ahead and be encouraged to go ahead and follow me on the YouTube channel J Brasco 951, J B R A S C O 951, because all the broadcasters' podcast episodes are there. If you can't find it on the audio download, or if you want to just, you know, be able to go and have it on YouTube because you watch a lot of things on YouTube, well, I make it available for you there too. Plus, other stories that I do in terms of my wrestling program and my umbrella series when I'm not podcasting, which talks about other things, but I wanted to put all that in mind. So, anyway, no interview this week. And probably not anything for next week after that as well. I'll let you know when interviews are are being made and put together once I'm able to get those scheduled. But I have a request being made out, and I will start looking at guests coming up. In the meantime, if you have anyone right now, now is as good a time as any. If you know someone that would make a great guest for the program, whatever kind of expertise, professional, actor, musician, executive, Behind the camera, behind the microphone, in front of the microphone, in front of the camera, in front of the stage. Please bring along to me. Tap me into getting to talk to this person, whoever this individual might be. I'd like to go and see if they might be a good fit for the program. So by all means, reach out to me, kingofpodcasts at yahoo.com, kingofpodcasts at yahoo.com. That's how you reach the ear on the program. Or you can follow me on social media. At King of Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I can be found all the way over there. All right. Digital disruption and the Hollywood labor crisis of 2020. We're going to start things off first with the disruptor of the decade. It's a story that was put out on New Year's Eve by Deadline.com saying how streaming has changed everything. And we'll do it again in the 2020s. What really caught everybody on board was February 1st, 2013. Why is that important? Well, that was when Netflix chose to deliver its very first original series, House of Cards. They provided it in one single bingeable chunk, as according to this article. Now, that pattern was not anything typical, British TV definitely pulled this kind of series together. We've seen many series before. But then a new era of how shows were produced and how shows were put together changed everything. David Fincher directed the pilot, his first ever series gig. Kevin Spacey, an Oscar winner himself, starring role. Then you had Orange is a New Black. Then Amazon would come about and bring on Transparent. Hulu would make it big with The Handmaid's Tale. And the streaming era was on its way to upending long-held business assumptions and talent relationships. It has challenged the established media guard in a more comprehensive way than any previous technology. And let's look at what's going on. House of Cards came to Netflix after the company was going in a rough spot. Because in the same way Blockbuster Video went away and the way the videos were being consumed, you had issues on how they were you know, offering monthly subscription plans for DVD sales or for DVD rentals by mail as well as streaming. It spun off its legacy DVD business and charged streaming customers. And then no more... No more mailing, no more snail mail. It was all streaming. 
Netflix is now worth $150 billion. Early Traction thinks the programming license for the same traditional media companies that ended the 2010s having to decide to try their own hands at streaming. So since we've had it, now we have Disney Plus and now controls Hulu. And then you have Warner Media and NBC Universal, which will be coming up later this spring. Then there are issues about the advertisers. A $70 billion TV advertising business. Audiences are becoming the train to expect limited, if any, commercials during programming. Netflix and other SVOD players release very little viewership data, emphasizing that they're more focused on subscriber acquisition than customary ratings met. At the moment, Netflix has 158 million global subscribers, and it's a distinct for the first mover advantage. And at that time, House of Cards was such a gamble for Netflix because they had outbid other companies committing to two seasons and 26 episodes for $100 million. And that's what they did. And that's how they've been able to win the war is because they have put a, they have outspent everybody else. So the corporate giants that are in established media, they didn't want to spend the money on certain shows that had big name stars. And so big name stars said, well, you know what? Not even so much that I had to get the money for it. We're just going to go ahead and move ourselves off of traditional TV because there was a trend in the 2010s where we started seeing stars from stage and screen, you know, basically from the movies, deciding to go ahead and take on TV roles in limited series. And that made a big deal for everybody. So then not having to go and be locked down to a 22, 24, 26 season, 20, 26 episode season changed everything. We all know that. So here we are. And now every big star has its own limited series and it's on any channel. So Netflix, Hulu, what have you. They're all finding their way to go somewhere else. The streamers are spending lots of money willing to commit the multiple seasons. Amazon has now mul has now multiple seasons ready to go to produce the Lord of the Rings series. Apple has the morning show with Reese Witherspoon and Jennifer Aniston. Big, big money actresses. And so traditional networks had to adjust their models and step up. HBO, for instance, had not committed to more than a pot off of a pitch before House of Cards. In order to remain competitive, it started to give straight to series orders to big packages like True Detective with Matthew McConaughey and Wardy Harrelson or Big Little Lies, top line by Reese Witherspoon and Nicole Kidman. And then the others followed suit in the 2010s. And then the showrunners started getting to the mix of getting the big money from the streamers. Shonda Rhimes, Ryan Murphy going to Netflix. Kenya Barris, the direct, the people behind Day of Game of Thrones, David Binoff and Dan Weiss. Nine-figure deals by Netflix to get all these producers on board. Warner Brothers shelling out $400 to $500 million to keep Greg Berlanti and J.J. Abrams. Phil Lord and Chris Miller being kept by Sony Pictures TV. Also, nine-figure deals to keep them on board. FX Networks described the deal-making climate during his executive session of the TC Summer Press Tour. It was like this. Quote, it feels like we're standing in a crystal clear stream and a, like and a river runs through it. We're fly fishing and our neighbor is up the river and then somebody comes in with a bag full of handed grenades, pulls the pins and throws them into the river, scoops up all the fish and then says... We're better fishers than you are. And there is more. So, when you got to ask yourselves, yes, the money, the star power, the talent that you're bringing in, one of the things we also noticed about all this, which is not in this deadline article, is the fact that we've had a lot of programming that's gone on there that might not have hit the mark. Again, you are giving the autonomy to big name stars, but the truth is these stars are not the ones that have all the creative ability. They're just getting to be executive producers of certain projects, but they might not be the best at, at getting this project off the ground because they're given complete creative control on top of the big money deal they got. Then you're only bringing people to that program for star power and not for the content itself. And that's the problem. It's not what I like about this, but this is what they're doing. And the money they're being made. HBO's Big Little Lies. 
Witherspoon and Kidman were able to get $1 million per episode in their second season. Kidman is being paid $1 million per episode for Hulu's Nine Perfect Strangers. Witherspoon and Kerry Washington landed $1 million plus an episode for Hulu's Little Fires Everywhere. And the morning show, Witherspoon and Jennifer Aniston are making $2 million per episode. So they get to work these TV shows. They're not having to work, they're not having to work months upon months on a movie set. And they're getting to move along a story that runs in one minute, in one hour. You know, and, and it's a different structure than TV programming as opposed to movies. And you can see it. It's quite fascinating. The other thing that happened is that some of the legacy programming that we've seen from the networks that were really good. When originally Netflix had access to all these programs, they all left. And then the bidding wars went for all these different programs for hundreds of millions of dollars. Shows like the Friends in the Office, like Friends in the Office, repeating on Netflix, sent the prices up. NBC Universal paid five hundred million dollars to move the Office to its upcoming streaming platform, Peacock. Warner Media spent four hundred twenty-five million dollars on Friends, six hundred plus million dollars for The Big Bang Theory. Netflix spent five hundred million dollars plus for Seinfeld. And then the hunger for content has spilled over to the drama side. As Dick Wolf and Universal TV are getting interest for the massive portfolio of Dick Wolf produced procedurals, Law and Order, Law and Order SVU, All Law and Order Criminal Tent, and others. FBI, he's doing as well. And now let's move along into how this deals with the issues of the Hollywood labor dispute, which is now in the 2020. Streamers have smoldered at the negotiating table the past years in overall contract talks between the Hollywood Guilds and the Alliance of Motion Picture and TV Producers, AMPTP. They're now starting to play a major role in Tinseltown labor relations and are said to be a key factor in 2020 in the WGA, the Writers Guild of America's upcoming contract negotiations with the studios. Now, as we know at the moment, we are dealing with, and this, this story kind of over gives the overall, but we're going to go into more of a deep dive in just a minute. The Writers Guild standoff, which we've chronicled all through 2019. Let me go back to when we talked about this in 2019. Because I pulled the story that I originally talked about this, this time last year. December 21st, 2018, I brought this story up from Deadline.com. Hollywood labor strife looms on two fronts in 2019. And I talked about labor relations can be in there for their wildest riot in decades, an actor strike against the ad industry, and a potential writer's walkout against their agents a week later. And as we talked about, the battle for the Writers Guild and the Associated Talent Agents for a new franchise agreement. The agreement would be that the Writers Guild would want to put an end to the inherent conflicts of interest involved in packaging deals and the big agencies forays into content production and financing. So where are we with that? Well, the latest story we have on that is they're in court. Writers Guild is now going up against the big three town agencies and a trial is expected to start March 2021. So, the two sides in a court filing, and this story is from December 27th, from Deadline.com, that a proposed trial start date of March 2021 for the legal showdown has lasted more than already than eight months so far. Because remember, then the negotiations started in April. That's when the franchise agreement, the original agreement had expired, and now here we are. So again... You have a court filing and a trial start date of March 2021. We're going to have to wait, what, 15 more months for that court case to get through? Are people going to wait for that to happen? And how it's going to affect other people? The trial could last 20 days. And that Judge Andre Barati Jr., indicated he'll refuse to throw out the federal antitrust lawsuits filed by the agencies, the CAA, WME, and UTA against the Writers Guild of America. 
A scheduling conference in the case is set for January 10th. And let me go back into the other part of the story where we talk about the franchise agreement. The major point of contention is where the Writers Guild of America ordered of its members in April of 2019 to fire their agents in mass who refused to sign as code of contact, which originally banned packaging fees and agency affiliations with related production entities. And since then, the guild has modified its code to allow signatory agencies to continue packaging until January 22nd of 2021. And even longer if it doesn't get two of the big four agencies to sign up. The latest version of the guild's deal also allows agencies to own up to 5% of an affiliated production entity. So there's where we are right there. Now, we may mention that Netflix is one of the major shakers, movers and shakers when it comes to content, that they could be a, playing a legal, a, play a role in the upcoming Hollywood labor drama. Netflix is already doing to do their own deal when it comes to striking a deal with the Actors Union SAG-AFTRA and then the IATSE, the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees. The union that represents Hollywood's craftspeople and technical workers, that their negotiations with a new contract with Netflix was made. So Netflix is trying to beat to the game because they're not part of the major negotiations. I don't know what that means for the Writers Guild and what their deal is. But then Netflix has the ability to go alone in labor negotiations because unlike Hollywood studios like Disney and other tech rivals like Apple and Amazon, it does not belong to the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers. AMPTP is a collective bargaining group that represents studios and negotiations with unions representing actors, writers, and directors. So as a result, Netflix would not be subject to any contract dispute that erupts between unions and studios should they fail to reach agreement on new film and TV contracts. So now, those all expire next spring or early summer. So writers, actors, and directors continue to work on Netflix even if they staged a walkout with members of the Producers Alliance. So Netflix could be the one that brings people to the negotiating table. But again, there's not a rhyme or reason as to everybody working in lockstep and pure harmony trying to go and work together in this dispute. In streaming media, a news story that's coming up as well, besides the labor dispute, is the fact that there might be mergers and acquisitions coming up very soon. A New York Times reporter is mentioning now that they're starting to say that the streaming video market extends well beyond the U.S., but many of the biggest names haven't looked overseas yet. Disney Plus hasn't made its way over to the United Kingdom. HBO Max is showing no signs it's coming anytime soon. So again, there's an issue of getting overseas and getting programming available, much like it would be on cable or other places. Those deals have to be made. At the end of the day, homegrown material, wherever you are, is surprisingly popular. And so we're seeing that other issue. Where we could see pipes and content providers giving companies like AT&T their very own streaming cable service and infrastructure. And that with this new competition from companies in the telecom sector... They're leveraging content they purchase or partner with to extend their services over cable lines. So basically the idea is to continue to go and have cable and streaming outlets or, or cable environments to go ahead and work together with the streaming media channels to kind of bundle up. And I think bundles are going to be coming at some point pretty soon. That's going to have to happen. So the way the cable model works, it might be something like that that happens. And again, I've said that other companies, some other media companies are going to have to come in, telecom or whatnot. They're going to have to come in and make it affordable for all these people to come in instead of having everybody just be in individual deals with individual streaming media platforms. Now, let's look back at how Hollywood labor disputes have gone along. A short history, if you will. The last time we had this issue was back in 2008. In 2008, we had a three-month walkout, which crippled, and this is from the Writers Guild of America with the major film and TV studios back in 2008. 
It crippled TV production and overshadowed Hollywood's award season. And so, first of all, you had to deal with the Writers Guild of America and the AMPTP, the bargaining arm of the studios, holding negotiations for a new contract for 10,500 screenwriters. Then, after the expiration of that contract, talks with studios broke and WGM members went on strike, shattering 20 years of Hollywood labor peace. Late night TV talk shows were immediately thrown in the reruns. Then contract talks came back in November 26 of 2008 after the strike was blamed for delaying several films' productions. Then the People's Choice Awards and Golden Globes were presented in January 2009 without stars or gala ceremonies after actors threatened to boycott the events rather than cross writers' picket lines. That's how things came out back at that time. And then before then, again, 14 weeks with the Writers Guild having a strike last time. 1988 was 22 weeks. It was the longest strike in the Guild's history. So you're going to ask yourself, when is this going to happen? I mean, what are we going to deal with right now of all these different strikes? And these are always the same strikes organized by SAG-AFTRA, Screen Actors Guild, and the American Federation, uh, Federation of Television and Radio Artists, the Writers Guild, the Directors Guild, and usually it's been about demands for better composition, especially residuals. Usually the major goal. This time we're talking about packaging deals. We're talking about digital inclusion because the digital streaming outlets are they incorporated in their own separate deals or are they part of the same studios and channels that are also part of the negotiations? Because there's a lot more people that are in this. But the Writers Guild has always been one of the major spot of points of contention for all these strikes. In the modern era, what is it, 1960, 1973, 1981, 1988? No, it's 85, 88, and then 2007, 2008. There we go. There's a lot of things here to think about when you look at the whole picture. It's scary to see right now where we might be by the summer and, and really to figure out what's going to be affected by all this programming. Who... Will, will late night talk shows go silent and go to reruns? Will we have delays on movie and TV productions, significant ones? Maybe they have new projects that are going to be in the, the fold that they'll be, be able to be greenlit and shot and produced pretty quickly to make good. But, so, but there'll be a number of legacy programs that will go away for a period of time. Would that also affect certain TV programs that we might have? Will, will the audience care? about some of these shows being gone for more than a year. Well, some people do. And I remember people complaining about, you know, where Game of Thrones took a significant amount of time before their last season came about. Or, say, Walking Dead, or, say, Better Call Saul, or I don't know. Because there's some shows that they could take a significant time off before they come back. But when this could be something that could be resolved... I mean, listen, I understand. This is a monumental moment. This strike deals with digital disruption and a true chance to break the old Hollywood system. I understand the reason why it's all being done. But at what point do you go ahead and put the cost of this strike and create the picket lines, which are going to ultimately hurt the content creators, the writers, the producers, the people behind the scenes, that are going to have to go and hold picket signs, are they going to want to? Well, that's what you got to ask yourself. These are the issues that people are going to be worried about more than anything else. That's what I'm worrying about. That's why I'm focusing so much on being able to go ahead and follow this story because I think it was fascinating. There wasn't a whole lot to be said throughout 2019, but I think there's going to be much more, and we're going to follow along with it here on the program because I think it's very important. Music had to go through this with their streaming media disruption as well. And the record labels are hurting as a result, and they've had a lot of issues as a result of all this. What changes? What comes up next? So anyway, well, I'm going to move along now into some other stories that I wanted to bring up. Keep it on Hollywood. There's a new California law that came into effect for January 1st. Let's talk about that from Backstage.com. Not Backpage. Oh, my God. Backstage.com. So a new law will change the way Californians do business, including actors 
It's called Assembly Bill 5 or AB5. It's a landmark law mandating that independent contractors in California be classified as employees. So the law, which was heralded by the state's progressive legislature, adds protections for working people in an increasingly gig-based economy that conditions the side hustle lifestyle. According to the new law, if a worker is under a company's directive while doing labor that's essential to the company's business model and they don't perform the same service for other companies, in 2020 they will be an employee, not an independent contractor. SAG after talked about this in a statement. They said, AB5 is not directed at our industry, quote, and we do not believe it will trigger a change to industry practices. So if the bill isn't intended to shake up Hollywood, which industry are lawmakers after? Well, they're saying that rideshare companies like Uber, Lyft, and other corporations of the app-based renaissance are preparing for a dramatic shift in their acceptive business of model of non-unionized freelance labor. According to the Actors' Equity uh, Guild, I guess, or Actors' Equity as executive director, Mary McCall, she says the AB5 is an important step toward reigning in the abusive practice of companies who can unfairly misclassify workers as independent contractors, undercutting fair wages. A healthy and thriving theater economy means the actors and stage managers who bring a show to life are fairly compensated and are protected with standard protections that employees in other industries have, like workers' compensation, and if they become injured on stage or backstage. So when it comes to California artists and what they can expect in 2020, well, they can now expect a tax form. Under the new law, employers can no longer file a miscellaneous catch-all form 1099. They now must submit a form W-2 for employees requiring the businesses, not the worker, to pay into social services. However, not all California freelancers are happy about the bill. Recently, Vox Media laid off 200 freelance workers citing the new law as the reason. As to whether other states will adopt similar legislation, it's unclear. But for 2020, California is the frontier. Now, it's an interesting story. And where... This is an adventure for other areas, but the Hollywood actors being able to go and see that the gig-based economy might be changing with new labor laws is another interesting story to look at. Very fascinating. I just made mention of that story about Vox Media. Well, let's bring on Vox Media and let's talk about a year of media upheaval. I actually just wrote a story. Sarah Fisher wrote about this about a week and a half ago. And I'm not going to talk about the political part that I talk about here, but I think there's certain things that are brought up that I think should be noticed. The U.S. news media industry being one of the most turbulent years ever and most transformative. So the big picture was there were enormous business challenges which resulted in a number, unprecedented number of layoffs, desperate product maneuvers, and fire sale deals. So 2019 was a particularly brutal year for older news industries like newspapers, magazines, TV, and radio. Established media, if you will. Revenue for television was down 4% in 2019. Print down 20%. Legacy magazine brands, once considered must-reads like Sports Illustrated, struggled to find suitors. Magazine titans like Condé Nast, is expected to miss their revenue numbers given a bleak advertising forecast. Univision, one of the largest media companies, serves America's fastest growing Spanish population. It's now looking for a buyer to help crawl out of a massive debt hole driven by a private equity investment gone bad, which was the buying of the Gizmodo Media Group and all all of their digital news sources. Yes, That deal that we talked about with Nicole Jordan here on the program and that I made mention of on the program, that has directly hurt Univision. It took down a major media giant like Univision that decided to do that, plus some other deals he did in terms of corporate and social conformity that have now really destroyed Univision, that they now need to go and get themselves out of debt. So again, another company making some stupid decisions that... Put them in the debt, and now, again, private equity, gone bad. That's what it does. 
And then we talked about this in the newspapers, that legacy industries still continue to serve local news markets, mostly void of the same investments financially and in tech and talent as national outlets. Two of the biggest local newspaper holding groups, New Media, which holds Gatehouse and Gannett, and McClatchy, which collectively house over 700 newspapers, had a combined market cap value as of Thursday of less than $800 million. 700 newspapers worth $800 million, less than $800 million total. Apple, which this year launched its own news product, is worth more than $1.2 trillion. So yes, the way newspapers are, newspapers are dying by the paper every day. Meanwhile, other newspapers that serve major markets, they went and shut down. Youngstown, Ohio's Vindicator went down after 100 for the years, and California lost the OC Weekly. Regulators aware of the realities that legacy industries and local media face in the digital world continued efforts to level the playing field, mostly by trying to r- roll back decades-old rules that may be keeping them from growing. But their efforts have proven mostly moot, as most consumers have recently migrated away from those mediums to a handful of apps owned by Silicon Valley titans. Policymakers did begin to more meaningfully consider regulating Internet giants in 2019. One of those is the Consumer Decency Act, I'm thinking, or Communications Decency Act, making changes to that is one of the things. But a great lot of Congress and powerful lobbying forces have so far prevented any meaningful Internet regulation from being passed. Now, in the markets, uh, they talk about the IPOs. We'll move along with that. In the big picture, they talk about, as a result of these realities, investor sentiment in digital media has begun to slip, and the investments in the sector are predicted to decline in the next decade. So that matters because over the past five years, Private investment into media companies soared at all levels. You know who also went through this? Radio. iHeartMedia is the best example there is. Private investment, private equity. It's like a cancerous tumor. When those companies know they can just pick up a debt-laden company and just ferret it off and the vultures come in, that tells you things are going wrong. Many of the venture-backed media companies were expected to go public eventually, like BuzzFeed and Vice Media, are not heading in that direction. So the gambles did not pay off. Get woke, go broke. Disney this year wrote down all of the $400 million it invested in Vice. Vice, dead on arrival. And all the ma- all the publications that go underneath that, Disney bought. They have to write it all off. Pathetic. But it's some of the social, cultural, political conformity that's out there. When you're not delivering what the audience wants, then that's what happens. And that's a bigger problem. Do we want to talk about this politics? I'm not going to talk about it. But some people can see the writing on the wall. Some that went political when they're not even meant to be for that. Then, you know what? If you're not taking care of the mass public and not acting as mass mediums, then of course you're not going to do well. And who does this really hurt? Well, the journalists and the news industry employees around the country. By some estimates, nearly 8,000 people were laid off or lost their jobs in media in 2019. The highest is the 2009 recession. But again, yeah, you can say jobs in media were lost, but how? Think about that. Look at who look at the people that were running these companies and running these jobs under private investment. What do you expect? This is the same thing that happened with iHeartMedia and Clear Channel and with other companies like Citadel and Compass Media. Same thing. And Cumulus Media, I should say Cumulus as well. But think about all that. 8,000 people lost their jobs. And now the challenges that most media companies face is they're forcing them to innovate faster and reach new heights. Most media companies distribute content to far more people than ever before through dozens of new channels ranging from Netflix to TikTok. And many broke stories this year that will define the generation, they said. The Washington Post investigated into the decades-long lies told by officials about the war in Afghanistan or the Miami Herald's explosive reporting about Jeffrey Epstein, which was just in the last year. Because those are the stories that people would care about that affect 
people personally. Again, five questions, five senses. Those two investigative stories tell you everything. But also notice those came at the end of the year. Where about the rest of them that were going on in the 2010s? Were there anything that was being said about that? And who's got the resources or the opportunity to go ahead and do things like that? Well, think about it. Who are the ones doing the investigating right now? Not these major stories, not these major uh, outlets. They're not getting allowed to do that. So what they were actually good at, they don't have the resources nor the money nor the manpower to be able to do what they need to do. So digital media is hurting right now. And you think being digital, it would not be disrupted. But when corporate entities, when corporate tentacles get into this and private equity vultures get into it, hurts the medium and the whole industry all together. And Axios told it right there. You can blame politics all you want, but no, this is on you. You did it to yourselves. A lot of major mistakes were made. And that's why the media, digital media industry and the news media is hurting. That's why journalism is dead. It's horrible. I go to Twitter and YouTube to find stories and listen to response videos or watch response videos and everything else. And that's where we are. So we have news aggregators. We can't, there is not one, one website or one outlet I can go look for news on. And I've talked about this before. And how many places do I need to go to follow news in order to get the story that I need to learn about, even for this program, to make sure I get the right story? Tell you how hard it is. It really is. To really look and find the real details of a story, sometimes you have to go to places you don't expect you need to go to. And honestly, social media and Google and you know, and being in all the other search engines that are out there that are helping to aggregate all this news, they're also have they also have an agenda to go with more corporate type, reputable according to them, reputable uh, channels for reports. But even they make mistakes, and I'm not going to talk about fake news, but we know that's out there as well. And there's a lot of stories that don't get retracted, and a lot of stories without reputable reporting, with two sources at least. Confirmed with real sources that could be brought out to the fray? None of that. And that's a big problem. So for 2020, a new thing happening now is that iHeartMedia, since they decided to get the IPO going, now IPOs, the, the IPO has gotten a little bit better for them. And year to year for iHeartMedia has gotten a little bit better. Obviously, Bob Pittman is... He is all over the place, regular executive of the year, podcasting his radio's birthright, all this bullshit he's been saying, right? And all of a sudden, iHeartMedia now, they get themselves mostly out of their bankruptcy mess, get new private equity partners, they get about 75% of the debt forgiven, basically. And now, Liberty Media is back in the mix, looking to acquire a larger piece of iHeartMedia. So an affiliate of the billionaires of John Malone is looking to acquire a larger piece. This is according to the Wall Street Journal, citing people familiar with the situation. The deal under consideration would give Liberty control or outright ownership of iHeart Media. And that caused the shares of iHeart, and this is on December 13th. So two weeks ago, their shares went up 14% to $16.64. And before the rally, the stock had been down 19% this year since they relaunched their IPO. The deal would put Malone atop an organization that includes Sirius XM, Pandora, and the largest stake of Lion Nation Entertainment, the top concert promoter. And he would be the, long, the biggest owner of terrestrial radio stations. It would potentially give the company enormous sway over the way millions of Americans consume music. So if Sirius, iHeart, and Live Nation can work closer together, according to this story, this is from San Francisco Chronicle, a uh, story from Bloomberg's Nick Turner and Jerry Smith, but I found it in San Francisco Chronicle. They said that it would help them ward off competition from tech companies' streaming ambitions. Liberty currently has a 4.8% holding in iHeart through Liberty's uh, Sirius XM group. 
The stake was converted from equity from into equity from debt when the radio station owner emerged from bankruptcy. And now the Justice Department is considering the request to require a bigger stake. And it wouldn't be the first time that, her, that Liberty Media and John Malone wanted to take over this company before. Try to do it in 2018 after deciding the company was, was worth less than it thought. And IHAR had previously rejected Liberty's $1.16 million bid, $6 billion bid for a 40% stake because it wasn't enough to satisfy the company or its creditors. So if Liberty Media, Sirius XM, and this big media conglomerate comes into play, number one, will it be allowed to by the Justice Department? Will this conglomeration pass the muster? I don't know, but keep that in mind. Now, moving into the story, remember the iHeartMedia iHeart Radio is the largest owner of radio stations, 858 broadcast stations. So now lawyers for the Justice Department are scheduled to delve into the potential anti-competitive implications of a merger in greater detail in January and February, according to sources from the New York Post. I'm reading from now on this story. Until the agency makes a call, Liberty, which controls Sirius XM and Pandora, is unlikely to proceed with an offer. Sources added. Now, the, justices, the, the Justice Department, excuse me, biggest concern is likely focused on the potential for reduced competition between Sirius XM and iHeart if they merge. iHeart's current owners have an incentive to invest in the stations to compete with Sirius, but if Sirius and iHeart were to be owned by the same company, the new owner could have less incentive to throw funds at the broadcast business, which makes its money from advertising as unhappy broadcast consumers may simply jump to Sirius, which charges subscription fees. Now, Malone and Liberty Media may move in the iHeart space, even if he doesn't get approval by the company. Because the source explains, quote, Sirius may want to expand a satellite radio platform into terrestrial radio because millennials don't pay for anything, not even the $5 a month for a Sirius starter plan. Also, the law and numbers suggest Sirius could soon hit a subscriber ceiling. So the question is, how long is Liberty willing to wait? Liberty will want a yes answer from the regulators before pursuing a deal. Otherwise, it won't waste its time. Now, the Justice Department already made Malone deal with issues back in December when it threatened to force events promoter Live Nation to divest Ticketmaster unless it agreed to certain anti-competitive concerns, including a promise to not retaliate against venues that refused to use Ticketmaster. Liberty owns a 33% stake in Live Nation and agreed to a deal with the department on December 19th. Interesting story there. Now, bringing up streaming audio and streaming media, an interesting story from Engage, Engage, excuse me, is the fact that in the U.S. music market, streaming now accounts for 80% of all music listened to. How about that? From Chris Holton in Engadget.com, he says that Streaming has completely reshaped the face of the music industry over the last decade, blah, 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 blah. The RIAA has said now that the streaming accounts for 80% of the music market compared with 7% in 2010. From, so from decade to decade, look at the change. Subscriptions in 2010 were 1.5 million. Now there's 61 million subscribers between 2010 and the first half of 2019 and going to the recording industry Artists of America. That's incredible. Spotify made in the U.S. in 2011. Apple Music debuted in 2014. And then you have more options, including Tidal, Pandora, YouTube Music, and Prime, uh, Amazon Prime Music. 81% of Americans now have a smartphone, compared to 35% in 2010. And then physical sales of music accounted for 52% of the music market. Digital sales, 38%. But while sales aren't buying CDs so much, people are not buying CDs so much anymore, vinyl's back on the up. Sales rose from 50, billion, 50 million excuse me, in 2009 to 450 million in 2018. So no matter what, people listen to music, they're not going to radio for it. So John Malone decided to deal with satellite and radio merging together in a bigger entity. I get it. I get what he's trying to do. He's conglomerating the live music business, the music industry, 
to attach to radio stations, satellite radio, and whatnot, and trying to get that whole audience all together. With satellite radio, which will allow different language uh, rules than terrestrial radio does. My question is, what does the FCC say, FCC say about this as well? If this merger comes in, are they going to be consulted by the Justice Department in the same vein? That's another question I would ask about that story. I have one other story I want to bring up before we close things out, and that is a death in the industry which shocked a lot of people. Last week we talked about the retirement of Tom Joyner, the fly jock, while another legendary disc jockey, shock jock, Don Imus, best known for his Imus in the Morning Radio Show, which he launched on WNBC-FM in 1971. He died last week at the age of 79. And just to give you the heads up about Don Imus and what his whole industry is about, and people knew him as Imus. You could see it out there and you'll know everything about it. Thank you from The Hollywood Reporter. His three-hour program was widely popular, especially over males 25+. plus. Imus was loved or hated for his caustic loudmouth. Un- outspoken in an age of political correctness, his often coarse satire offended sensibilities. Yet his listeners included those whom he often ridiculed. Guests included President Clinton, Dan Rather, Tim Russert, Bill Bradley, David Dinkins, Rudy Giuliani, political analyst Jeff Greenfield, who he once remarked, he's out there, quote, talking the way most of us talk where we're not in public. From the AP, one of the things that people will always remember is that he did make some comments that were racist and misogynist about a mostly black Rutgers women's basketball team, I think it was, and the phrase nappy-headed hose was used. Everybody remembers that. So his show is home to presidential homefuls, political pundits, and his favorite musicians. It was a must listen in the media and political corridors of New York and Washington, D.C. And his show, he was named one of the 25 most influential Americans according to Time Magazine. At age 28, he came onto the airwaves. His caustic persona, though it would later serve him well, was initially a problem. He was canned by a small station in Stockton, California, for uttering the word hell. The controversy only enhanced his career, a pattern that continued throughout the decades. He would move to larger California stations, earning Billboard's Disc Jockey of the Year Award for medium-sized markets, after a stunt where he ordered 1,200 hamburgers to go from a local McDonald's. (laughs) I heard that call. It was pretty funny. He moved to Cleveland, and by 1971, he was doing the morning drive time show on WNBC and AM 66 WNBC in New York, the nation's nation's largest and most competitive radio market. He was a shock jock before the germ was coined, in the same vein that we talk about Howard Stern. And listeners flocked to hear what outrageous things he'd say, like phoning people to wake them up and ask, are you naked? (laughs) He played characters like the radio evangelist Reverend Billy Soul Hargis. His demons also made it an open question many mornings whether he'd show up for a 6 a.m. shift. He was fired by WNBC, but returned in trial two years later, adding a new vice, cocaine. When his career turned around, his first marriage, which produced daughters Nadine, Ashley, Elizabeth, and Tony, fell apart. His struggle with addiction in 1987 led him to a stint at a Florida alcohol rehabilitation center, coming out just as WNBC became WFAN. And Imus would be held on as this morning anchor. He was then inducted to the Radio Hall of Fame, and MSNBC signed up his simulcast when the network started in 1996. He engaged in a long-running feud with Shock Jack Howard Stern, who usurped Imus' position as the number one morning host in New York City. But as he retired, Howard Stern referred to Don Imus as one of the top five radio personalities of all time, Gave himself the same rank, adding Arthur Godfrey, Wolfman Jack, and Jack Benny. He says about Imus, he had a big problem with me, I didn't with him. You know, I wasn't the biggest uh, person to listen to God's other son, as he used to call himself, Don Imus. I thought it was okay. It wasn't my cup of tea, obviously, it was for a different crowd. And I never got to hear more of his uh, bits and all, but you can obviously look for that on YouTube. 
There's a lot of people that have put out some tributes and some air checks of Don Imus. If you want to hear what he sounds like, just do a search for Imus in the morning. You'll find it. And you can check and see what he was all like. But yes, he was, uh, he was out there. And from what I've always heard from many people, Don Amos was hard to work with. But, you know, you can respect somebody that has had longevity in the business. And he probably, I would think he has much more personality and much more staying power and much more entertainability. Than, is that a word? I'm not sure. Than anybody else would be on radio today. Anybody that's on radio right now, they probably couldn't hold a candle to Don Amos. And that's what it comes down to. So age 79, Don Imus, um, he was hospitalized Christmas Eve, according to a statement by his wife, Deirdre, his wife of 25 years, and his son Wyatt, died complications from lung disease. And I believe he was a smoker. I'm not sure or not. But anyway, there we go. So Godspeed, Don Imus. Thank you for all the years you have put us on the air. Anyway, that's going to take it up to the hour for this edition of the Broadcasters Podcast. I thank all of you for listening to the program. First episode of 2020. We're coming back with another episode. We'll go into more deep diving into some other issues. And I will start getting some more interviews all set up and ready to go for all of you for the next time. And I'll give you the heads up when we get to those interviews very, very soon. Should have something lined up for the later part of January going into February and March. I'm going to start stacking those episodes and getting some interviews all set to go for all of you to check out yourselves. But thank you all for being here starting the third year of the program. And I'm so thankful for all of you to check out the show. And I hope you'll continue to spread the word about this. And obviously those that are, you know, that you know that are content creators that might be interested in some of the stories I talk about. I hope you'll think about it. And I hope you'll give me feedback as well. King of podcasts at yahoo.com. Or hit me up on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at King of Podcasts. I'd love to hear from you and learn about what you would love for me to talk about more about here on the Broadcasters Podcast. Because remember, content is king and the control of your content is in your hands. Thank you for listening to the Broadcasters Podcast, presented by BroadcastersPodcast.com and KingofPodcasts.com. The Broadcasters Podcast is brought to you by kingofpodcasts.com slash Amazon. If Amazon is good enough for the King of Podcasts, it most certainly is good for you. kingofpodcasts.com slash Amazon. And don't forget to check out the King of Podcasts wrestling program. The Wrestling is Real Podcast, exclusively at kingofpodcasts.com.